I'm on a Saturday to watch this. Welcome to Running a Build Farm with Fedora and Arm. Today we're going to talk about um, what's involved with uh, building Fedora for the Arm processors, um, the trials and tribulations, and the challenges we've needed to overcome. So, um, I guess you're asking first off, uh, who are we? Well, over here we have uh, Mr. John Chiapetta, our resident Python whiz, and uh, general go-to guy for anything we need automated. We have Mr. Anthony Bocha, who's in charge of building our kernels and taking care of our servers. And I sit around the office and look pretty. Uh, so, uh, some of you may be asking, what is Fedora? Fedora is a popular uh, Linux distribution. Uh, it's, I believe it's ranked third at the moment after Ubuntu and Linux Mint. It's open source, meaning that uh, anyone, can, can, anyone has access to the code. The source code for everything is available for anyone to use, modify, and redistribute. Uh, it's community driven, meaning that um, anyone can join into a larger community that consists of the various engineers, uh, programmers, user base, any, anyone can help with the development of Fedora. You don't have to be a professional, you don't have to, you could be a hobbyist, you can be a user, you can be anything. And uh, Fedora is all about the newest and the best. Fedora is on a six month release cycle and it attempts to include uh, the latest and the greatest of what open source software has to offer. So um, for those of you unaware, um, ARM processors are um, a reduced instruction set computing processor. This um, may not mean anything to some of you, but essentially it just means that it's really good at stuff it's specifically programmed to do. Uh, ARM processors are really low power. Um, as Chris Tyler says, they essentially sip electricity, drawing only uh, five volts of power, or five volts of electricity, sorry. Um, and because of that, ARM is usually used in uh, mobile devices. A lot of you have tablets or iPads or iPods or handheld gaming devices or anything like that, really. And a lot of those are, almost most of them, are universally powered by ARM uh, chips. Um, there are several different ARM architectures, but the two we are concerned with are ARM v5 TEL and ARM v7 HL. Uh, now, without going into too many specifics, uh, basically, ARM v5, our software built on ARM v5 can be run on ARM v7, but not vice versa. So, um, what exactly do we do? Um, well, obviously, we built Fedora for the ARM architecture. Uh, using almost exclusively ARM hardware. That means uh, the majority of our build farm is powered by ARM machines, which we'll get to in a bit. Uh, we find and fix bugs with the build process. Occasionally we'll come across something that doesn't quite build for ARM, and we try and find a solution or a workaround for it. And uh, lots of companies like to send us their new ARM hardware, and we try and get um, Fedora up and running on it and incorporating it into our build farm. Um, you may be asking, how do we do it, as the slide title says. Um, so we, we use a number of tools, including, and we're, we're going to get into these a lot more in depth later on, um, but a quick rundown is, our, is the RPM, uh, which stands for RPM Package Manager because recursion is all sorts of fun. Um, it's an easy way to uh, package anything from software to documents to music to pictures to really anything and redistribute it anywhere. Uh, we use a tool called Koji to mass build uh, RPMs and we'll get into what that means in a bit as well. Um, RPM, some RPMs depend on other RPMs. Uh, so uh, we have a tool, we use a tool called Styrian developed by John Chiapetta to help uh, smarten up the order of which we create the RPMs, where we create the ones that everyone depends on first, and then we build our way up. Um, we also use Sigil, uh, which is a tool to essentially put a stamp of authenticity on, on the RPM packages, meaning that um, they, that's, yeah, it's a digital signature that basically says, this is coming from a reliable source. What is in this RPM is what we say it is, and it's coming from a reliable source. It's not going to contain anything malicious. And again, we use another tool um, developed by John Chiapetta called Moji, which is kind of a scaled down version of Koji, which he'll talk about later, that is meant for rapid deployment and building. 
So, uh, I figured I'd show you a picture of our lovely little build farm here. Look at that. Look at that. There, it's, it's beautiful. <laughs> Cabling nightmare. It's um, consisting of over 60 ARM devices, and we're going to give you the breakdown of uh, what's powering it at the moment. So, up at top, you're going to see uh, something called pendulums. That's what these look like. We got 30 of those. These are the, the core of our build farm at the more moment. They use an OMAP 4430 dual core processor running at uh, 1.2 gigahertz. It's an ARM, it uses an ARM v7 HL architecture, and it has a giga RAM. And these are mostly our powerhouses. This, the specs may seem a bit modest, but in terms of ARM devices, this is actually pretty good. Um, we use these to, we're actually using them to drive our uh, Fedora 15 build effort at the moment. That's what they're being occupied with. And, um, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, backing up the uh, Panda boards are uh, 20 Guru plugs. These are older plug PCs. They're a bit smaller than like a carbon monoxide detector. And um, they have a uh, 1.2 gigahertz single core Marvel Kirkwood. Uh, they're only ARMv5, meaning that they can only build ARM software for ARMv5. And they have 520 megabytes of RAM, but they are very stable and um, they're very good devices. We like them a lot. Um, and finally rounding that off, we have uh, 10 Atika Smart Tops, which are significantly weaker than uh, the rest of the devices in our build farm, uh, with only an 800 megahertz uh, freescale single core and 512 megabytes of RAM. But they do something the uh, Guru plugs cannot, which is they're able to build software for ARMv7 HL. In addition, we have um, various other devices that uh, people have shipped us. Um, we have uh, BeagleBoard, we have an OpenRD, and of course we have one in of the infamous Raspberry Pi. Um, so uh, one issue we came across fairly early on with uh, our build farm was uh, one of power. Uh, as you saw, we have a big rack of, actually it's about yay high, of uh, 60 devices. Um, and that has very low power requirements considering it's ARM, but it still has power requirements. And we only have three uninterruptible power supplies, which for those of you who don't know, are like really big battery packs that you connect PCs or servers to so that when the power goes out, they don't um, yes, that is the technical term. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one, one of the issues we have is that there are too many just to connect to the three uh, universe, uninterruptible power supplies, sorry. And even if we did have enough outlets, uh, the UPS doesn't have the capacity. Um, I think I actually mislabeled the name of this power supply. Um, so I apologize in advance if I had this wrong. I should have caught that while reviewing these. Um, but this is a power supply um, from TRC. They cost about 20 bucks. So, and um, what we decided to do was we're going to plug about three of these into our UPSs and then have these guys power our panda points. Um, these things are actually really great. I'll show you them in action. You can actually see the cables running from it in the cable nightmare there up to the panda boards. Um, these things actually have the capability to run up to 15 panda boards at a time, but we only have them running 10 at the moment to A, not stress the uh, power supplies, and to B, give us a tiny bit of overhead. Uh, so now that we've taken care of the hardware, um, well, we need some software. Um, otherwise, the hardware is just kind of sitting there looking all shiny. So uh, because we have a variety of uh, different hardware, we're going to need uh, an interface between the hardware and the software. So with that being said, I will pass it on to Mr. Anthony Bocha, who will tell you all about kernels. Okay. Hi, I'm Anthony. Uh, so I'd just like to start off just giving you a quick overview of what a kernel is, I'm sure most of you know. It's essentially just acts as a translator between the user space level, or the application level, and the hardware level of the system. Uh, it contains the drivers and instructions uh, for anything that you're basically doing up here to access things down here. It also helps with the, uh, manages the resources of the system. Uh, so why do we need to use custom kernels? Well, there's a few reasons why we need to do this, especially when dealing with ARM. 
Uh, the first main one being is that there's no standard set ARM kernel uh, in the primary architectures like x86, for example. There's kernel developed teams that, that push out new kernels and stuff with updates. With ARM, it's a little bit different because there's so many different types of machines. A lot of them are in alpha stages. A lot of them are just coming out with new types of hardware and different things that when you actually do acquire it, you need to build something custom for yourself to get it to do what you, exactly you want it to do. Uh, in our case, we had a few requirements that needed to be met. Uh, different builders obviously needed different types of hardware modules and stuff compiled with them, as well as we needed to actually include a few things into our kernels for when we were actually building software. Uh, certain packages require certain dependencies actually within the kernel, uh, one of them being IP version 6. Uh, we had, uh, I'm not sure if specific, I think Ping was one of them that had an issue. It needed IPv6 uh, in the kernel in order to be able to compile successfully. Uh, another thing we actually had to add into our kernels was ACL support, access control lists on the file systems, just for extended permission abilities. Uh, that was more for our own usage, uh, not really for builds, but just a little added tidbit. Uh, so right now we have different kernel versions running on all of our builders. Uh, the Panda boards, as you can see, 2.6353 is running on them right now, and the Gurus and Afrikas are running 3.04. Uh, the reason why actually the Panda boards are running 2.6353 uh, is because when we attempted to build a 3.0 kernel for it, actually 3.04 because at the time it was the most stable kernel that had been uh, was out, uh, we had an issue specifically only with the Panda boards where during operation they would actually the file system would switch into read only mode and we weren't able to write anything. So the problem with that was when we we're actually building packages, anything that needed to be written to the file system for a mock or, or anything like that was not actually able to be done. So we had a lot of builds that were failing. So we needed a quick workaround, something that we could just implement fast. Uh, so we end up dropping back to 2.6353. It's just a quick compile, it was able to work and was stable enough for us to be able to run the panda boards in the meantime while we actually tried to look for a proper fix for our 3.04 issues, which if anybody has any you know ideas, feel free to come up to me after and let me know because racking my brain at it for a good three, four weeks now. Uh, the Guru plugs, actually up until I think about a week ago, we were running 2.6.33 on them. That was a fine kernel, it actually worked well for us for our previous releases, but during uh, the build process for Fedora 15, they were having a lot of issues with uh, failing builds and stuff, and we eventually traced it back to the kernel version, so we figured why not update so we brought it back up to the latest and stable version uh, that, uh, again, that was available at the time, which is 3.04. And the Afika Smart Tops, we actually had out of our farm for a while, up until about a month ago. Uh, when we were uh, doing the whole kernel update effort with the other machines, we decided, let's try and get them up with something. So why use 3.04? Well, Fedora, if some of you probably already know, is all about the latest and greatest developments in the open source uh, world. So we figured at the time, this is the highest kernel that's available in primary, why not go with that? So we ended up building that, and it's been proving to work quite well for us. It's an interesting side note, actually, for uh, anything that's running 3.04. Uh, some of you may be aware that um, the, when we have builds for packages, they actually, when they're compiling, look for a kernel version of the 2.6 variety. A lot of them, none of them really looked for the 3.0. Uh, this was a problem that we were running into quite a bit. So on these, uh, the Guru plugs and the Afikas currently, the kernel actually registers as 2.6.40. I had to drop that back in order for us to get around some build issues as well. So uh, it's been a fun problem solving in the past couple of months. Uh, so we have to get our uh, kernels up by using a process known as cross-compiling. I'm sure some of you are familiar with this. Uh, basically what cross-compiling is, is uh, you're compiling for a specific architecture using a different architecture. So in our case, we were compiling for ARM on x86 machines. The reason why we had to do this, there was actually a few. Uh, the first one being that when we actually get these machines, they don't have anything running on them yet. We need to get something up so that we can start to use them. So we actually have to uh, begin compiling them first on a different architecture machine, bringing it over, testing it. Once we get something up that's nice and stable, we can actually begin working with the machine. Uh, in order to do this, we had to utilize an ARM cross tool chain, which we actually grabbed from um, the Fedora development team, I believe, sorry, from primary. Uh, 
that cross-compiling tool chain is basically just a group of software uh, that would allow us to compile for ARM on our x86 machines. And uh, it, we actually enjoyed, uh, sorry, not enjoyed, we cross-compiled for another reason, which was speed. Speed was a very big factor. We're, we're compiling on multi-bit uh, x86 machines where we had quad-core processors. So compiles, for example, the Panda boards were only taking about two to three minutes uh, per kernel, which was very nice, especially if you're bringing something up, you're getting some errors, you want to bring it back, fix those errors, get it compiled again, and bring it back over. So it was great in that. Yes, sorry. Uh, sorry if I missed it, because I was just taking. Yeah. Do you build your own cross compiler, or do you just use one of them? We're actually, yeah, we're using specifically the Fedora ARM cross tool chain, okay. uh, uh, which, or? sorry. Uh, yeah, that's we, we actually got it. I don't know if you're familiar with John Masters. Who's talking about it. Yeah, I know John. Okay, for sure. Uh, so yeah, that's the tool chain we're using. I can get a source for you if you want. No, I, I just uh, I use cross tool, cross tool ng and stuff like that. So I just wonder whether you built your own or whether you just. Oh yeah, no, we just yeah, I grabbed it from over. Okay, so. Uh, sorry. So yes, uh, speed. Uh, it was about two to three minutes per compile on the x86 machine, which was nice, especially when we were running into a lot of problems. Uh, when we actually compiled natively, it was taking about 40 minutes per kernel. So you can tell it's, it's not very efficient to uh, be waiting 40 minutes for something that you're going to have problems with, have to go back and fix, and then wait another 40 minutes. Uh, we actually have a little internal policy where we like to have everything compiled natively before pushing it out uh, into our farm. Uh, that's just, it, it feels a bit more like everything's actually running on ARM, everything's been built by ARM, as well as Having it compiled natively, it'll be compiled with the same tool chain that our packages for our Fedora releases will be uh, built on as well. All right. So what about software? Exactly how do we get things built? How, do we, how does our farm function internally on the software level? Uh, I'm actually going to push you over to Jordan once again for that. Hello again. Yeah. So what about the software? Well, um, to get the software on... Uh, the ARM devices, we use a tool called RPM Packages. And as I said before, they're a really easy and convenient way to pack up anything such as software or game levels or audio or documentation or kernels or whatever conceivably you want into a nice little package that can be installed on uh, any system you choose as long as the architecture is correct. Um, RPMs have uh, have a neat little thing. Uh, when you when you construct an RPM, sometimes you need, if, especially when you're packing up software, you're gonna need you're gonna have dependencies. You're gonna need a specific compiler or a programming language, and or uh, a specific library you might need. And um, the other thing, uh, the other dependencies RPMs have are um, when you install them, if in order for whatever is in there to actually work. Uh, the pe certain dependencies must be in place, certain pieces of software will require other pieces of software, and so on and so forth. So uh, when you build an RPM, uh, which, is, uh, which consists of simply, uh, if, you're, if it's software, you compile it from source code and uh, put, it, put the uh, compile binary into a package with a set of instructions on how to install it, uh, how to upgrade it, and how to remove it. Um, RPMs have this sort of thing built in, uh, built in dependency evaluation in order to uh, say, well, I'm not going to install unless X, Y, and Z are also installed. Otherwise, you're going to have a broken piece of software. Um, so uh, an easy way to install RPMs, and one that several of our tools make uh, use of, is a nice little utility called Yum. As I said, it's a fast, convenient way to install RPMs. It actually has automatic dependency resolution. So when you're trying to install something like, say, WordPress, which is a, another example he's going to get back to, um, it's going to say, well, WordPress is great. It's a bunch of PHP stuff. But I need a PHP interpreter. I need a, uh, a web server. And I need a database. So it'll, say, it, it, it'll uh, query a YUM repository, which is essentially an index of packages that has their name, their size, their date. And it'll say, uh, when you yum install a package, it'll say, I want to install this, but I need that. So I'm going to grab that. And if the package, the other packages it grabs, it grabs have dependencies, it will grab those as well. Um, 
So how do we build the RPMs? Uh, well, most of our tools used to build the RPMs make use of another piece of software called Mock. And what Mock does is actually really cool. It will actually, it will both build and then test the RPM to see if it actually installs. And it does this by uh, creating a ch root, which in very, very simple terms, is a folder containing a file structure similar to a root file system. And it will use yum to uh, fill the ch root with the bare minimum packages you need to actually run an operating system. It'll have like a little fake kernel, it'll have GCC, it'll have bash, it'll have all the, the, the bare minimum software you need to actually get a Linux system up and running. Um, and then it will attempt to build the RPM. And if that has dependencies, it will try to fetch them from a YUM repository. Uh, now what will happen is if the, um, if the dependency it's trying to grab doesn't exist, mock will fail and say, well, you need to build this first and push it out to the repository. Uh, if uh, after the uh, building of the RPM succeeds, uh, sorry, after the building of the RPM succeeds, um, it will try to install it in the C truth and will try to install the dependencies of that RPM if there are any. And if it doesn't, it will also fail and the exact same thing happens. So. Um, another piece of tool, or another piece of software we use that use, makes use of Mock is something called Koji. Koji is a great service that helps automate the building of RPMs. It's broken up into several parts. Clients, which can be anyone with a laptop or desktop or conceivably anything that has, that's authorized to submit things to Koji, send a request to the hub along with um, the base stuff needed to build the RPM. And uh, Koji, or the Koji Hub, will then say, all right, uh, I have a list of all the builders. You saw earlier all the builders in our build farm, the 60 on machines. It'll s and it knows uh, who's building and who is free to build. And it will pass it off to, a, to one of the builders. Or if there are no builders available, it will hold on to it until a builder is available. Uh, Koji also has a handy little web interface, uh, which I have a little screenshot of here. And it's a nice and easy, convenient way to uh, check on builds. It allows you to monitor, uh, it allows you to monitor the progress of builds. It allows you to see what's been finished. Uh, it, it actually allows for a list of users and to see what users build what package. And an interesting thing about Koji is that after it builds an RPM, it'll actually create a new repository with that new RPM in it. So anything you build that needs to be used as a dependency will automatically be there the next time you try and build something, which is very convenient. Um, well, and that brings up an interesting problem. Um, if we're just randomly submitting builds uh, without any concern for what depends on what, we're obviously gonna have a lot of failures. So uh, our, John, our own John Chiapetta developed a solution to that, and he's gonna tell you about that right now. Okay, thank you, Jordan. Um, so basically, uh, as you know, uh, Fedora contains a ton of packages. Um, it's built on roughly around 10,000 uh, packages. These packages have the dependency, uh, dependency, well, some of them do. Actually, I should say most of them have a, a lot of dependencies. And uh, if these dependencies aren't uh, satisfied first, uh, if these packages aren't built first, then uh, these dependency problems will cause failures. Um, and this is not good. So uh, we, need, we wanted a solution that was a little bit better than just uh, randomly trying to build packages, seeing what fails, and then building them again, kind of like a random brute force attempt. And also Styrene, which is the, uh, the product I mentioned, well, not a product, but the solution I'm mentioning is uh, written in Python. It will uh, produce uh, a nice uh, error management kind of console that I'll show later in an, a later slide. Uh, so that uh, people can visit it. Um, so like I said, uh, dependent, it's, uh, it tries to map out a set of, uh, a smarter order of like what uh, packages have what dependencies, which ones are built currently. So uh, second point, reads from Koji. So if uh, a package is already built and it was one of the dependencies, it'll mark that and be smart enough to know this is already built. And um, once it determines what's built and what's not built and what dependencies are satisfied and what isn't, it can send builds to Koji so it, 
it can drive our current, it works with our current build system and uh, it, pro it provides a web uh, front end that I can show in a later slide. Uh, so like I said, it's a, it uses a database behind the scenes and um, it contains a series of tables in the database. So for, we'll have a list of packages that uh, we want to build. Uh, and if it's not built yet, uh, the package, so for example, if we had WordPress that was unbuilt, it would go through uh, that table. It would look to another table that kind of points to that says, okay, what are the dependencies that are linked with WordPress? So the, it's called a capability name. So it's like, um, it says, I need this kind of functionality. It's like an, Eng uh, an English kind of, not like a package name. So it's like, I need a web server, I need a database. Uh, server and I need some uh, scripting language uh, functionality like PHP. And then there's another table that those capabilities point to with an actual package name that satisfies it because there could be multiple package names. For, so for example, um, HTTPD Apache could satisfy this. Uh, there's a PHP MySQL uh, package and then regular PHP uh, modules. So those so Styrene would, would say, okay, are these built first? And uh, if not, uh, queue those first and even check those for dependencies uh, too themselves. So it's like a, it's kind of like, not recursive, but this chain that, this tree that gets traversed uh, to try to build these packages in a smarter order. So that's like a, a visualization of the database layout uh, behind the scenes. Um, this is just a screenshot of uh, it in operation. I just wanted to show how it was, it's, it's pretty easy to use. You, give, you, you uh, reference the command and give it some argument like load, uh, load DB, which will load an initial database of a certain release of Fedora. So Fedora 13, uh, for example, it will load a database full of all the packages that need to be built for it and map the dependencies uh, in the certain tables. Um, and here you can, I don't know if you can see or not, it's kind of hard to see because the font's small, but it'll, this is the marking the database. So um, uh, you can see like there's uh, state numbers. So three would be an error of some kind. One would be it's already built. Uh, zero would be unbuilt. Um, and it does that for you automatically from Koji. Uh, so you don't have to do anything manually uh, except for run the command. And um, this is uh, part of the web interface. I t it's the top part of it. So you can see one of the problems with Koji is uh, it's a nice system. It's polished, but um, it lacks some features such as uh, there's no really easy way. You can do it, but it's, it's really hard to like, track the build status of a certain release of Fedora like, in one place. Like, you can't have, there's not just this one page that you can go and see, OK, this is exactly what's aired and this is what's not. And um, I wanted to make something that focused on what the community needs to focus on. So, so I kind of like, I tried to narrow it down so they could see, okay, these are all the packages in red, the errored packages that aren't built. And uh, it does a bunch of, it does a little, some little things like it'll track to see, okay, if someone's, it's multi user friendly kind of. So, if another uh, user is trying to uh, do a temporary, uh, uh, simulate a mock build, it'll record that. It'll say, okay, someone uh, requested to edit the spec file on this date, just so you can kind of see, like, it's a, little, it's a little more user friendly. You can see the Koji logs of, the, um, of a package, see why it failed, the mock logs. You can see a local mock log if anyone tried to build it locally, see why it failed. You can edit and save a spec file right from the interface. You don't need to open the RPM at all. You don't need to set up the RPM build folder that they use and then edit the spec file, put it back together, try a build. There's a lot of little steps that saves you. It's, it's a little more convenient. And then if someone is happy with the results of testing beforehand, they can send the build to Koji uh, one more time. And uh, this will track it uh, behind the scenes. And then this is the bottom part of it. Uh, I made this with a, a solution that uh, is developed at C, uh, being developed at CDOT currently. It's a cool little framework, a JavaScript framework to uh, produce, well, basically anything kind of visual using, uh, uh, I believe, HTML5 canvases. And uh, what I wanted to do here is just a little bar status graph. So 
we can see, okay, so for Fedora 13 that we're all trying to build, the community can click on each of the states. So blue would be completed. Green um, is uh, what's ready to be built. That has uh, zero of its dependency, zero or more of its dependency satisfied, if it has any. They all have to be. Uh, yellow or orange would be uh, what's currently being built. And then red is the errored part. Uh, so it's, it's cool in that I, I use that solution because it's kind of hard on a canvas to like, you'd have to keep track of uh, where your rectangles are and the borders and all that and implement scrolling. So I use Processing JS. Uh, I should have mentioned uh, it's called Processing JS. And you can click on the uh, different states and then it's a little scroll bar I implemented. Uh, I just wrote it up to uh, scroll through the, uh, so you can just scroll through the list. It's just a simple scroll bar, but uh, I still had to kind of create it. Um, this is just uh, an example of um, some of the, and this is an example of something in, inside a spec file that would cause an error. Um, and this is one of the future features that I want to build into Styrene. I tried starting it, but I, I ran out of time. Uh, it, um, you can, uh, in the spec file, sometimes you need to disable some sort of functionality. So for example, um, in this case, a, a package can still be built and have uh, most, most of its functionality there, and it may not need everything. Like gedit would still be a fine text editor, but if uh, the spell checking feature in it failed to compile, you could uh, theoretically disable it, compile it without it. And so that's sometimes what we do here. So uh, you can kind of see, it might be hard to read, but you would use a, like an if statement in the spec file language to say if the architecture's ARM uh, disable the package, uh, some package functionality, otherwise build, with, uh, build it with it. And sometimes this clears up some build errors. And so Serene can try to do this automatically for us based on past actions if we've done it before. Um, one of the problems that uh, I w wish to work on still that I haven't solved is uh, in the case of circular dependencies. This is, this is a bit of a, a tricky one sometimes because um, you get weird cases where packages depend on each other in a circle, and if none of them are built yet, which one do you start with? Kind of um, sometimes they all depend on a higher version of each other, and it's like this big circular loop of uh, nonsense. So I uh, there are some tricks to do it, obviously, because it has to be done. I just haven't uh, learned them yet, and uh, I'm, uh, this is a future feature that I uh, I wish to add into Styrene um, to try to help our team out in the community to just do this stuff automatically and save us time. Um, so the results, the results for Styrene so far, uh, I've tested only on uh, in building uh, Fedora 13 updates, and it did about uh, 3,000 packages of them, and uh, all automatically just just ran the Q builds uh, sub command of it, and it just went. Um, and then we actually got an opportunity to get the OLPCs in, which is the one laptop per child where they send a, a really inexpensive but good quality machine to a child in Africa or somewhere, and they get to play around with this stuff. And so we got a couple in test, and it was running Fedora 13, and we did a yum update, and it seemed to work. Uh, I rebooted the machine, and everything was still running. Uh, this, and uh, as always, in the tradition of open source, I wanted to post the URL. I can give this out uh, later if, if you're interested. You don't have to uh, uh, write it down. But I have another slide with it in it. Um, and so that's basically it. So I'll transition now to we build these packages. And uh, how do we know whether or not they're valid? How does an end user verify that these packages are, they are what they say they are, and they came from who they they say they came from. And I'll hand it over to Anthony with the signing. All right, uh, signing packages. This is a quite enjoyable process, at least for me. Uh, in case anybody's wondering, uh, what, basic, what signing a package means is you're actually putting a digital signature on each one of the RPM packages. So for example, in the 10,000 plus odd RPMs that we have, we actually sign them with this signature that proves its authenticity, proves that the source it's coming from is valid and you don't have to worry about malware or anything, you know, if it's safe. Uh, so each one of our distributions are fully signed with keys that are generated in-house by us. 
Uh, how exactly do we go about signing them? There's a few ways you can sign RPMs. Uh, the simplest being the command RPM dash dash add sign. Uh, that's a great way to you know to you generate your own key and you use that command to assign a key to a single package. The problem with this is in our full releases we have upwards of 20,000 plus packages and they don't pay me enough to sit there and go through 20,000 plus packages one by one. So we had to find a solution that allowed us to just do a whole whack of packages over a span of however long uh, automated. And we actually found Sigil, which is a signing server. And I'll get into that right now. So Sigil is a package signing server. It consists of three components. There's the server element, the bridge element, and the client. Uh, client obviously being the end user who is issuing commands to the Sigil server. All commands actually run through the bridge, so the server is completely isolated. It's on a private land. You can't get to it from the outside world. You have to go through the bridge. It's sort of the, the doorman, the bodyguard of the server, if you will. All the keys that we generate actually reside on the server, so the end user doesn't actually touch these keys. They have no way of you know, modifying them or you know, uh, actually signing them to packages manually on their own system. It has to be done through the server. Uh, so just to give you a quick little, this is a visual diagram. We have the client here on the public network able to talk to the bridge. The server, obviously on its private little LAN, only able to speak to the bridge as well. Uh, the client will send off a command, for example, uh, with for a single RPM, we do sigil, uh, sign RPM. You specify the name of the package in our setup. It will go off to the bridge. The bridge will then query Koji for that package. It will grab it, send it off to the server. The server will run its uh, signing uh, process, sign the package, send it off back to the bridge. The bridge will then put it back into Koji in a separate directory underneath the, the uh, root directory of that package. So we have uh, in our directory stack a, the unsigned package, and then under there, there's another directory which holds the signed packages. And that's actually what gets pushed out to our release uh, the repositories, excuse me. Uh, we actually don't go about it doing the whole SIGL sign RPM one-liner way. We use a, a script that was, uh, we found, it was actually from the Fedora primary uh, standard of practice for signing. It's called SIGL sign unsign. It's a Python script written up that you specify within it the key that you wish to use that is on the server, uh, sorry, the, the public ID of the key that you wish to use that resides on the server, and you issue the script, you specify in Koji which distribution uh, you'd like it to sign, so under a tag. So what a tag is, is whenever a package is built, you specify a tag, for example, distribution Fedora 13. So underneath that will be all our built packages for Fedora 13. So you send off the SIGL sign on sign script, tell it, I want you to get everything under this tag, check it, and see if it's signed. If it's not signed, the script will detect that, it will then run the one-liner for you, which will uh, query from the client to the bridge. It will grab the package, send it off to the server, sign it, and throw it back into Koji. Uh, our latest performance stats for that were actually when we built and signed uh, Fedora 13 uh, for our release. It took about three and a half days to sign roughly 25,385 packages. So it's not too bad. It's a lot better than sitting there going one at a time. Uh, so it's a great solution that we were happy that we got implemented and we're definitely going to be using in the future. Uh, so to bring you back over to the package building side, uh, I'm going to pass you over to John, who's going to talk about his other creation, Moji, which is uh, essentially a scaled, the scaled down version of Koji. So he's going to explain about that. All right, thanks, Anthony. Um, Moji, this is... Uh Written in Python as well, open source, obviously. Um, it uh, does what, the, one of the problems with Koji is that, uh, well, people think, <laughs> people view this as a feature, actually. I shouldn't say problem. Uh, <laughs> you, can, uh, you can only build a package once, uh, probably for a good reason, uh, in that you want to, when you build a package, you can't uh, build it with the same uh, version number, release number. Uh, the, the whole package has to be like, kind of like a unique uh, build. Um, and, I, and the reason I, I believe is that uh, it's e it'll be easier for someone to track down the original source of a build. There won't be any confusion or, or complications. So um, for Fedora 15, we had to um, do uh, an initial build of F15 outside of Koji once. 
on F13 builders, and then we wanted to build it again, at the whole package set of F15 on F15 builders. So we had this multi-build step kind of thing that we had to do outside of Koji because of that one, one build uh, limitation feature. Uh, so I tried to write it, I, I wrote uh, a basic client server model, uh, standard sockets, uh, if, if you're interested in that stuff. Um, it uh, forks a process uh, to deal with a, a client, um, doesn't use threading, uh, just because uh, I haven't had much practice with threads. Uh, it's centralized uh, solution, so there's one server, it's distributable, so there's many clients, um, and it supports Obviously, it has to support uh, some sort of plain text mode and binary transfer mode. Usually, if you do c command line FTP stuff, you come across this. You need to switch into different modes based on the data type. Um, so I had to kind of write that uh, from scratch uh, just to. And so uh, this produces a web interface as well, so people can track what's going on. It's not a, as functional kind of as uh, Styrene, but it's a different purpose. Uh, you can see what, what packages are aired out, which ones are done, completed. Uh, you can click to see, uh, click on a package to see its logs. You can see a list of builders here. Um, you can see if they're authorized, if they've authenticated, if uh, it's just a plain text basic password authentication, nothing special yet. Um, what package they have, when they started it, their last ping time, that's just a debug. Uh, and then, um, so it supports this uh, client server model. Um, and then it's just a funny picture I drew up of, of the layout. Uh, again, it's kind of similar to the uh, picture of, of Koji that uh, Jordan showed you. Uh, we got the different builders connected to a switch and all of that connected to a main switch that's connected to our hub server database machine. And, um, and then that's connected to a router to the internet. So the rest of the community can run Moji and connect in, obviously, through the internet to that server. And our builders can connect internally to that server. And uh, OK, so what I, wanted, what I want to add to Moji is uh, a more reliable client server model where, we, where you fork a process for every client. Uh, it's a little more reliable. Right now, it's just running in an un unblocked loop, a single loop that's keeping track of everything. which and um, Sometimes on shady, slow connections, the file transfers get kind of like mucked up. So um, uh, I need a more reliable communication between the client and server. Uh, definitely a cleaner web interface that's a little more simpler to use. And uh, if we take it seriously, a better security model of uh, confidentiality, integrity, authentication. Uh, there's algorithms for that uh, beyond the scope here. So uh, what what uh, did I find with this? We uh, we ser so far Emoji has served almost we're almost at the 4500 F15 package mark. It's been able to maintain connections to 40 plus builder machines at a given time uh, to coordinate this whole thing. And again, the source code is hosted at this URL that uh, uh, I can give at the end if anyone's interested to help me improve. I always uh, love seeing the fixes that other people do. Because uh, I can learn from that, um, and um, and so basically we'll end it with uh, Jordan to talk about uh, the future of Fedora Arm. Possibly. Uh, thank you. So um, there's a couple exciting things happening uh, these days with Fedora Arm and in the near future. Uh, there are a lot of educational efforts uh, being run using ARM, like uh, even Upton's Raspberry Pi or the One Laptop for Child program. And we'd like to become further involved with this, further developing a robust operating system that children can use to learn how to program, how to become computer scientists, how to become system administrators, all that good stuff. Um, also, um, um, their ARM hardware these days is not that powerful, but there is, but many, Companies have actually announced server grade ARM hardware. So, something beyond the scope of uh, just something that could power a cell phone or a tiny plug computer, something that could be run in an actual data center. And a uh, cool little advance of that is that recently ARM version 8 was announced. And uh, while uh, ARM, the versions of ARM we're specifically using right now are 32 bit, ARM V8 will be 64 bit, which means that 
these tiny little chips will become a lot more powerful and a lot more robust and a lot better. So these are exciting times for that. On a more um, project-oriented goal, um, the, there are numerous architectures that Fedora supports, but there's a delineation made. Uh, there's primary architectures, uh, which in this case is just x86 and x86-64, which most of you using uh, laptops or desktops, aside from you with the uh, e-pad, <laughs> um, um, are using x86 and x86-64 processors. Um, the second, Fedora has a number of secondary architectures, including us, ARM. They support Spark, PowerPC, and several types of mainframes. But hopefully, uh, with the stuff that John's developed and our work, we will be able to um, hopefully in the future push Fedora ARM up to a primary architecture so that everyone can use it and it will be widely supported. So um, that about wraps it up. Uh, we have about two minutes for questions if there are any. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you comment about the, uh, any automated testing that you do post compile? Uh, automated, automated testing? testing. Um, oh, mock, you mean? No, for. Anything that you do to test the kernels once you've done the compile and you've. Oh, to test the kernels? Uh, depending on what system we're actually compiling for, the first thing we do is we go in through the JTAG, the console, uh, just to make sure it boots. We check out a D message to see if there are any errors that are popping up that are of any importance, like to fix. If they're, for our purposes, if we have an error that we can do without fixing it, we will. But uh, essentially, what I do, what we do is we build them, throw them on. First of all, we make sure it boots. <laughs> And then as it boots from there, we go about you know hunting down if there's anything that we need to worry about. Then we begin using the operating system. We put our root file system on it. Uh, we boot that up. We attempt to first go through a mock build of a large package. Usually we like to pick Perl or something about that variety that uh, can sometimes cause complications. Uh, we check to make sure that that builds successfully, uh, even the timing to see you know if there's anything we can do to tweak RAM in the kernel or something like that. Uh, once that's successful, we then get it set up on our build farm with Koji. So we implement it in that to make sure it can happily talk to everything and function well on the network. Uh, if builds get done in Koji, then we pretty much know which should be in the clear to push it out. But we then monitor it for a good couple of days afterwards to make sure that nothing's failing on it due to uh, like read-only file system problems, like I mentioned before, or any permission issues that we may have missed. So, uh, you had a question. Yeah, uh, the hardware you're building on is um, pretty slow. Did you guys try um, building anything on a simulator at all? On like a, on a virtualized yeah. ARM machine? Yeah. Like using uh, KVM or Zen or something like that? Or Quimu. Or Quimu, yes. Sir. Uh, X86 hardware. But uh, we ha uh, we've considered that, but we think it's actually better to build it on the actual hardware because then we'll be able to expose bugs that would show up on the actual hardware rather than just in a virtual environment that's fairly controlled. Mm. Mm. Uh, uh, we can talk about this later if you want, but I was fascinated. You said there, there was an issue with the kernel, 304 kernel on a pandemic. Yeah, well, on the, the uh, board. only bug. 3.04. freaks me out because I'm going to be trying to build Yocto for a panda board next week. Okay. And I had no idea that there was any sort of possible kernel issue with read-only file systems. So yeah, we haven't pinpointed it yet, but it seems whenever we're running a Well, I work at the same place where the guy who's the kernel person for Yocto works. So oh, okay. I can bug him about it on Monday because okay. we're, de we're designing the BSP for the panda board right now. If there is something going on there, we want to know about it. Okay, for oh, sure. Well, then we'll, we'll ask him. We can definitely yeah, talk uh, afterwards, for sure. Uh, uh, anyone else? Uh, no? Well, thank you for showing up to our little talk at thank you. 9 o'clock in the morning on Saturday. <laughs>